the answer is actually get away from this point about doing the work and getting, getting results. I mean, we need that. If you don't have results, you don't have anything to talk about. But then the second half is, well, you got to be, you know, a persuader, I guess. It, 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 uh, you have to be an influencer. You have to actually talk the talk. You have to understand the business. You have to explain how do we make more money by doing better design. Welcome to UX Ignite. Fireside chat with industry leaders. Uncover user experience knowledge with your host, Kuldeep Kelkar, your partner for all things user research. For 10 days. Uh, we'll get started since it's already 11.01 Pacific. Um, welcome everyone uh, to a live episode of UX Ignite. Uh, UX Ignite is a fireside chat with industry leaders, and I'm your host, Kuldeep Kelkar, your partner for all things user research. I lead the user research practice, and I'm a senior partner at UX Reactor. And today, we have not one, but two special guests, Jacob Nielsen and Kate Moran. Welcome, Jacob. Welcome, Kate. Thank you. Cool. Why don't we jump in and get started? And so, Jacob, uh, I think it, it would be it would be hard for me to introduce you <laughs> given your 40 years history with user experience and I'm sure the attendees would love to hear your history, your background, how you got started with user experience and, and how has the journey been. So why don't you introduce yourself and go through the, the illustrious 40 years of, of your life. <laughs> Thanks, Kuldeep. Yeah, so I'm Jacob Nielsen, and it's actually now 41 years because I started in 83. And I started, you know, as a more academic side of things, and then gradually I moved into more, more practice. And I say even before that, I should kind of point out that why did I even start at all? And I think it comes back to some experiences from both my childhood and also my kind of teenage years in high school because my parents were both psychologists and they took me to see their labs and all of that. And I kind of experienced this point that we can actually learn things by observation, by, by doing experiments. So that was kind of one, one big lesson that stayed with me until I then started doing that myself. Uh, the other one was in high school, I was actually you know, very bored in high school, which is what sometimes happens. Uh, and so I really diverted my attention a lot to using computers instead. It was in the early days of, of, of um, computers. And so I got access to a computer sort of like in the basement of the university that was a very old computer. And some of us high school students were able to use it because one of my buddies, his dad was a university professor of computer science. And it's a very old computer, but it was very hands-on. It was from before the age of time sharing. So really a personal computer that took up, you know, an entire room in the basement, but it was like a personal computer. And so that was kind of fun and engaging to use. Then I started studying at the university and got access to like the big computer. And that was terrible to use. That was very unpleasant, oppressive experience of using a timeshare computer with enormously terrible documentation. Everything everything we talk about UX, they kind of did the opposite, I would say, in that mainframe computer. And so that experience of computers can be fun in high school. They can be oppressive as actually a computer science student. That led me, that that kind of conflict let me say, oh, I can't, it can't be better because I already know it can be better. And so that's why I kind of changed from studying computer science to studying human computer interaction. Uh, I got my PhD in that. So I was like rather academic in the beginning. I was university professor. I did some, you know, I worked at a fundamental research lab at the telephone company in the United States. I became a distinguished engineer at Sun Microsystems. Now we're talking at the, the dot com bubble time at starting. And that was maybe the most exciting time because the internet it was booming, booming, booming. It was growing at a rate of 300,000% in one in just one year in the very beginning. So that was a big, big, big revolution. And I think that experience of living through that revolution is kind of, I see it happening again now with artificial intelligence, which is like another revolution of that type, extremely fast, fast changes. And so kind of at the end of, of, of working at Sun Microsystems, um, I then kind of Change, it became maybe even a little bit more practical and I started a consulting company and then I worked there for several years. And then more recently, which is kind of the most exciting, um, I kind of, I would say actually kind of like burned out of, of having to cater to clients and 
trying to make money and and those type of things and and uh, which is really I mean I was really in some sense doing opposing my own philosophy which is you customers companies should do their own usability work they shouldn't you know outsource the highest somebody else to do it for them they should do it themselves it's really my main philosophy but anyway so I kind of I so I retired from from business and then I started um, UX Tigers which is my current home on the internet. And I also have a newsletter on, on Substack, but you can subscribe to that by at the bottom of the UX Tigers homepage. And so I'm I'm now changed to really be what I would call an influencer because I'm, you know, I'm giving this newsletter away for free. And so if anybody doesn't like it, well, I'll refund them what they paid for it. And last I checked, you know, a free newsletter costs zero dollars, so they'll get zero dollars back if they don't like it. So I could basically just write write what I want. And so I feel like very liberating. Uh, so that's really my entire journey from being very academic to like now being this is what I think, and you take it or leave it, and so, and 41 years. Wow, and, and, and Jacob, I have, I have to say this uh, publicly for everyone, so for, for those that uh, don't know me, uh, I did my master's from Clemson, South Carolina, almost 25 years ago, and I grew up on uh, Don Norman and Jacob Nielsen's books, and, and our professors had it, and uh, I was quite young <laughs> and naive 25 years ago, and and what a what an amazing thing for me personally to be having this conversation with you. I know the larger UX community feels that way. They are hungry. They are hungry for uh, hearing from leaders like you and Kate. And I know I look forward to that newsletter because I even 25 years later I learn uh, uh, every few weeks. So so thank you, thank you for that introduction. Thank you for yeah. everything that you have done for this community, for the UXers at, at large. So Kate, uh, why, why don't you uh, provide a brief history and uh, your introduction, and then uh, we will jump in with the set of questions that the, the, the attendees have asked. Sure, yeah. well, that, that is a tough introduction to follow. <laughs> My, my introduction will be quite a bit uh, more brief because yeah, unlike Jacob with his 41 years of experience now, um, I have a, a paltry 14 years of experience in the field. Um, but uh, let's see, a lot of my UX journey like yours, Cold Deep, was also heavily influenced by Jacob and also Don uh, and Nielsen Norman Group. And my first exposure to those uh, you know, thought leaders in in our industry was when I was studying for my undergraduate and graduate degrees at the University of North Carolina, so not too far away from Clemson. Um, and I, uh, I immediately, as soon as I, I learned about information science, which is what I studied, and human computer interaction, and then UX, I was, I was immediately like that. That is definitely like the perfect fit for me. I love writing and communication and people and psychology and technology. And I know like a lot of other people, that's what attracts a lot of us to this field. Um, so the, the way that I ended up working for Jacob was actually pretty funny. It has to do with um, my irrational perfectionism. <laughs> so when I was uh, about to graduate from my master's program, I was working on a thesis that was focused on flat design. And that'll kind of date when this happened because it was right around when flat design was very controversial. Um, Kind of a long story short, Jacob ended up reading my thesis and um, and you know had decided to wow. uh, interview me and eventually recruited me into Nielsen Norman Group. Um, but it's funny because I remember when I was writing that thesis, I was like, "Why am I working so hard on this? Nobody's ever going to read this. It's going to go into a pile of theses, and uh, you know it won't have any impact on my life." And that ended up being very untrue. Um, because uh, I, I had worked in a few other UX jobs, UX research and design um, jobs before Nielsen Norman Group, but I've been with NNG for nine years now, working for Jacob for nine years. Um, and it has been a major influence on my career and life. And uh, I just love getting to talk to so many people in the community. And we just really try to, to give back to the community and um, be a voice of reason and, and practical UX advice, which Jacob sort of established that as our as our ethos. Um, and then when Jacob decided to step away from NNG to pursue, pursue his other interests, he asked me and uh, three other women to uh, take over the company and, you know, run it 
in the spirit that he had established over 25 years. And so that's what we're doing. Wow. So actually, I should just add that it's really true that, that Tate's uh, thesis was very good. And honestly, most, almost all masters or PhD thesis I've seen have been so boring and irrelevant and, and it, to some, to be honest, a little bit, including my own, when I really think back of, on, on it. Uh, but but Kate's was really a very, very insightful analysis. And it was about something that was actually really important at the time, too. So that combination of those two, I think, was what's kind of sparked saying, yeah, this, this is good. Well, yeah. thank you. Well, well, thank you, Jacob. And thank you, Kate, for that introduction. So uh, let's jump in with, with the set of questions. There's, there's almost 85 questions that came in from attendees. We absolutely will not have time to go over 85 questions. I have several of my own, so we have a curated list of questions and the and the topic for today, the highlight is AI. Clearly, everyone has been talking about artificial intelligence or machine learning. Uh, uh, there's, there's all sorts of conversations that are going on, but not much is uh, available in the in the published domain. And so so given that AI is such a hot topic, uh, at a very high level, Jacob, what, what are your, your thoughts? Uh, what should designers and researchers uh, know about AI? How should they think about it? Where is this headed? Just high level thoughts and then we'll... Yeah. 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 But I think that the first question is, is it hype or is it real? And I really think it's real. And the way I... That's why I think that is because we now have a lot of empirical research, controlled studies that compare users using AI and not using AI. And we see that the people with AI are typically on the order of about 40% added productivity, so four zero, which is a large number in quantitative usability studies, really a huge uplift in productivity. And it varies, of course, sometimes it's more than double productivity, for, typically for programmers, sometimes it may only be 10 or 20%. Also shown from these empirical studies is that not just is productivity up, but quality is also usually up, not always, but usually up. And uh, employer user satisfaction is up. So it's not saying, oh, people are now working harder and then they maybe don't like it. No, they get more done and they like that because they can spend their time on creative tasks and being in the flow and the more mundane things are being done by the AI. And then uh, the, the additional finding also from now from a lot of studies is that AI narrows the skill gaps and it doesn't eliminate. Some people are always going to be better than others. This is just you know, biology. But how much better is the most, the greatest person compared to the worst person who's doing some job? And that difference is getting smaller. So it's uplifting the poorer performers. Um, and it's also uplifting the best performers. Everybody benefits, but the poorer performers benefit more. And so this is why I call AI a forklift for the mind. It just, it helps you lift. Just like in an actual warehouse, you know, a, a physical, a real forklift will lift the heavy packages. You don't have to be like extremely strong to work in a warehouse like you had to do maybe a hundred years ago. Similarly now, the AI can uplift our cognitive burden and free some of our brain power. And so that's why I think it is real. It's not hype. This is in contrast to maybe some of the other things, like some of the, say, the Apple new vision headset or things like that, which are very hyped up, which are very cool demos, but where we have not yet seen empirical research on actual you know, performance improvements of people doing real tasks. In AI, it's, it is real. And, um, that, of course, includes being real for people doing creative work as UX professionals do. So uh, our jobs will be among those that's going to get that 40% lift. And I say 40%, this is the current AI, so GPT-4, basically. Uh, and we certainly expect you know, better to come out this year. Google is sort of claiming that they may be a little better, and we'll see if OpenAI can like surpass themselves later in the year. I would expect that. If not, it's going to be next year. I mean, we ha we're still so early. That's the other point. Again, if you think back to the dot-com bubble, um, when that was taking off and they, they had these huge growth rates, I mean, the websites were so primitive and yet they could do things that people wanted. And the websites today are so much better than the websites were 
you know, back in, in 1994 when I did my first usability study of websites. And I would expect similar, but probably faster improvements in AI. So that's kind of, I have these kind of sayings about AI. And so like one of the sayings is that the AI you're using now is the worst you'll ever have because it's going to get, get better. And that means that these percentages in Lyft are going to get better as well. And so I feel like that's a major league change how we do UX work, how the users are using computers, the entire world economy will change. And this is again, not something you would say about a lot of other things if you're working on making a better calendar scheduling tool or something like that. Yeah, it's nice, it's worth doing, but you know, it's not like really revolutionizing the economy. This is on the order of the industrial revolution, in my opinion, it's like a big change in how we live and live our lives in the future. Wow. So, um, I jotted down the forklift, forklift for the mind. Uh, yes. Fabulous analogy, right? How how industrial revolution pretty much increased productivity. I think this is it did. And we had we had you know steam engines, we had you know electricity, those type of, of things came out. And at some point of time, some smart person thought, what if we take a steam engine and we put it on wheels and put it on tracks and now you invent a train? And that's still to come in AI. We're still using these very primitive tools, very primitive user interfaces, chat based on, come on, long scrolling pages. I mean, that's not how it should be, but it's so useful that even with the terrible user interface, people are still using it. Yeah. So, yeah. So um, Jacob and I spent a lot of time debating these these kinds of things. And um, largely, I, I definitely agree with Jacob that in terms of like the long-term potential, one of, one of my sayings I like to say about AI is that it's simultaneously overhyped and underhyped, uh, especially when it comes to our field, to UX. Um, so yes, we are definitely seeing that it, it has that capacity to lower, to, to decrease skill gaps, to sort of raise up and help people in the areas where they're maybe not as skilled. And I think that definitely has immediate value to our field. So people who, you know, might be really great designers, but they're not as comfortable writing, they're getting that, you know, writing help and drafting help from ChatGPT. Um, people who are expert researchers and they need to create some, you know, placeholder images for a prototype, for example, they can do that with Midjourney. Um, so we are already feeling in, in our field right now that benefit of raising those skill gaps. Um, I, and I do agree with Jacob that it's only going to get better from here and that I think the pace of improvement is, is going to be uh, astronomical, as we've sort of seen within the past year. Um, however, there are some, I have some concerns about these tools specifically for UX. Um, mm -hmm. One thing that we've been doing at Nielsen Norman Group is quite a bit of research on different ways that UX professionals can integrate AI tools into their workflows. Um, We've also been making a lot of contacts in the industry with with these different companies that are developing AI tools specifically for UX. And I have to say, <laughs> I have been very disappointed by a lot of them. Um, and this is where the hype comes in. I have seen products that are claiming to replace users that you don't you don't need to talk to any human users anymore because you have these AI anthropomorphized representations of them. I've seen claims that it's gonna replace user research. You're not gonna to need to, to run your own user research because AI is going to do it for you. Um, I do believe that AI very soon is going to have an, a much bigger impact on UX as a field, specifically UX research. That's my area of expertise and like my my passion in, in addition to content, which is why I'm VP of research and content at Nielsen Norman Group. Um, I think, you know, there definitely are a lot of opportunities for AI to reduce some of the redundant sort of tedious, boring aspects of UX research. And I'm excited to see better tools for that come out. But I think right now, the AI systems, the gen AI systems that we have, they really struggle with nuance. And that is a problem for UX because it's extremely nuanced, extremely contextual. So for example, I've, I've played around with and talked to and studied UX professionals who have been using various AI tools intended for qualitative analysis. 
they're terrible. <laughs> like, and again, I don't think they always will be, but I think for right now, a lot of UX researchers need to be need to be aware of this. And so when we're talking about raising the skill gaps, I do have a bit of a, of a concern for people who are less experienced in UX getting advice or uh, feedback or um, or findings about their products and not having enough awareness to know that it sounds right, but it isn't. Uh, so Jacob and I wrote an article um, about some tips for UX professionals who are getting started with AI for UX. Um, one of the things we said in there was really think about it like an intern. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, you can give it those tedious tasks. You can use it to accelerate your workflow. Um, it's great for, for ideation, you know, great for coming up with ideas, but you don't want it to be driving everything. You don't want it to be producing your final deliverables, for example. No, it shouldn't do the finding. I mean, I, I, and I completely agree with you that it's not going to substitute for an actual human user. I think it's very different when we talk about user research, you know, you're studying a person, you're studying human human beings, and they, they have to be human, they have to be the actual customers because that's the purpose of the, the study. But I do think that a lot of the analysis will gradually be, be possible to do, but you would have to, to check on it and, and, and make your own, draw your own conclusions. But I actually think that right now, maybe in, even the analysis may not quite be where the AI is, is skillful enough, but there's a lot of the prep work that it can do, do for you. And uh, it, it can also provide a lot of very customized advice that you presented with the problem and ask, you know, for, for advice. And again, you shouldn't just do what it says, but you, you, you should kind of like think about it, but it provide it, it saves enormous amounts of time. And that's again, that productivity gain compared to every time you do anything, you start with a blank page, you've got to fill it in. Now it will give you a starting point and actually it'll give you 10 starting point because, you know, like one of my other sayings is ideation is free with AI because you can ask it for to do 10 things or 20 things or 30 things. At some point in time, you don't want to read through more stuff, right? So, so there's a diminishing return there. But in terms of getting it produced, uh, which with human colleagues would be very, very expensive. Like if you got to talk to some designers and say, give me like 10 different prototypes of, uh, of this uh, you know, you know, shopping cart screen on an e-commerce site, that would be very expensive to get that made up. But you can go and get some of these uh, uh, sites that do designs for you. And, you, and, and then that would not be your final design, but it could give you 10 alternative designs you know, in one minute that you can then do some heuristic evaluation on yourself or to the, the top two or three, do some user testing with real humans, customers, right? Mm -hmm. You know, I one of the things that I hear a lot of people being concerned about, not just in our field, but, you know, at every job right now, people are like, is AI going to replace me? Is it going to, you know, is it going to do my job for me? And in, I don't, who knows at the pace at which the technology is improving, it's definitely, the very least, it's going to radically change every single job. Um, but in the, in the near term, you know, with specifically looking at UX, there's so much bad design out there still. Yeah. Um, and I'm sure that's frustrating for you, Jacob, because you've been, you know, pushing and advocating for free <laughs> for decades. Um, but there's so much bad design. There's so much research for any any product. You know, at NNG, we have a, we spend a fairly large amount on UX research because that's kind of our bread and butter. Um, we still have, you know, an endless list of things that we could study or would like to study. So any any advantage that we can get from AI in terms of decreasing the cost or the time requirements for mm -hmm. getting research done, I see that only as a positive for teams. Exactly. So I think you have to think very differently about a specific job and jobs overall. Those are two very, very different questions. So I think that most companies should cut their staff in half because you will be able to have people do twice as much, you know, in the future with AI. But that doesn't mean that the half the people in the world will be unemployed. It means that there will be more than twice as many new things that need to be done. And particularly in UX, as you were just saying, Kate, that the number of areas where there's bad design is so immensely huge. So what I think is going to happen is that individual companies will have smaller UX teams and they may and they may actually be much more distributed. So you may not have those centralized teams. You may not have jobs in the future of like VP of user experience being ahead of 500 people. Those jobs may, may just not be there. But instead, you're going to have hundreds more companies 
having two UX people, five UX people, 10 UX people, maybe a one UX manager. So there'll still be a little bit, but that entire kind of hierarchy that was in the past uh, up, 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 up and bigger and bigger and bigger departments. I actually think that's going to go away and UX will become a commodity. And some people say, oh, commodity, that's a bad thing. I actually think it's a good thing because it means that it's just being taken for granted. It's there. It permeates everything. It's the way things are done. Well, not right now, but again, if you think ahead, let's say 20 years, I think that's how it's going to be. UX is just the way we do things. And people may not even be called UX specialists. They may be called you know, something else. And it's just what they do. I mean, but they will do things like you know, user research, iterative design, all the various methods that we've devolved over the last you know, 50 years uh, will still be good. They'll just be much more efficient, much more integrated, and much less put off to the side as a special department. That's a little bit unfortunate for those pe people maybe in the audience who think, oh, my future career plan is like climb my way up that corporate ladder. That may not be so much there in, my, in the future in my, in my kind of prediction. But I think this is a very different question than uh, are there going to be fewer UX jobs? There will be more, in my opinion. In any individual company, maybe fewer, but many, many more companies will have it. In very, very, very interesting conversation. And um, well, uh, well, we'll know the future soon, I guess. Yes. <laughs> we'll, we'll know it within the next five. We might not have to wait 10 years. We'll, we'll know it within, within at least start to see some trends over, over the next few years. And, and um, uh, somewhat similar to what, what Kate mentioned, here at UX Reactor, we have been encouraging researchers to use the tools that we have right now. We've been running our own research on research, uh, which is quite meta, to understand how do the existing tools get used? Where are those productivity gains? What is that mind frame of, of, hey, give me more options? Whereas there are times when I need to make a decision and converge on a decision, right? And the, then give me more options and converge, options and converge. And so how do junior researchers adapt to that mindset? How do senior researchers adapt to that mindset? And and it's personally, I'm, I'm intrigued with the learning curve or the speed of the learning curve by which uh, and Jacob, I think you mentioned this, right? the, 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 the junior research, they, the learning curve really gets them the, the skills at a higher level. So right. a lot of uh, questions that, that uh, a lot of uh, attendees have been asking is, well, we have some tools here and now, right? We have uh, Google's Gemini and we have uh, ChatGPT, which is mostly used. And, and that is the AI that we see right now. And, and within a year or two, there will be more integrated, there will be more stuff that is happening. But, but the nature of many of these questions are, hey, are there practical ways designers and researchers can use AI in their current jobs? So, so do you guys have any comments on how can this, the current technology be used, not think so much about what will happen in a year or two? Yeah, I'll, I'll take this because I literally just did a study on this. <laughs> Just wrapped it up with um, some practitioners. Um, yeah, uh, as I mentioned, like there there are companies that are trying to build UX specific tools, and I do think that once those are not just available, but they're actually delivering on the promises that they're making, and they're also integrating into the tools that UX professionals already use, like Figma, um, Dovetail, like any other research repository tool, they'll be immensely helpful. But I haven't had personal experience with any that have been, you know, really wowed me and that I would I would go out of my way to recommend. Um, I'll also say that right now it's kind of the wild west in the AI market. There's there's a gold rush, and so there's tons of companies that are sort of popping up and getting insane amounts of funding. And then you know, ChatGPT integrates a feature, and then that company goes out. And so it's really hard if you're looking like across an organization or at an enterprise and you want to integrate tools into that workflow. Um, so unfortunately, right now, the uh, fortunately or unfortunately, the big ones tend to be the most reliable. So chat GPT, perplexity, perplexity, I really, I, I really like the team there. I've spent some time talking with their head of design, Henry Modisat. Um, they, I think, are doing some really good UI design work when it comes to AI. But so I, I encourage my team and other UX professionals, if you're starting desk research, if you're you know trying to figure 
figure out how to design a specific design component or you want to learn about um, you know, some domain for a client that you're about to start working with. Perplexity is a great place to start. They have a really big focus on sources. And so they, they sort of highlight the sources at the top of the page. Um, chat GPT is really great for, you know, writing emails, client communication drafts, um, for this AI study and AI, AI and UX study that I just completed, Jacob gave me the idea. He was like, why don't you try to use chat GPT as much as you can while you're working on the study? Um, so I did that. I, you know, gave chat GPT some information about the study I was planning. And then I had it create various documentation drafts for me, like my research plan, my interview questions, my screener. Um, and it was really great. I ended up with a, pretty much planning my entire study, or at least a first draft of it, within about two hours, which usually, you know, any researchers listening know. <laughs> That's not usually happening that quickly. Um, so that was great. But a few things that I would recommend if you're using ChatGPT in that specific way, make sure that you're providing a lot of context. And this is generally a good idea when you're interacting with any AI system. We're kind of accustomed to typing in a couple keywords into Google, because if you do more than that, the results are not going to be as good. We're having to sort of break that mental model and shift to if I tell ChatGPT I'm running a diary study, that's not enough content. <laughs> I need to say I'm running a diary study. I'm studying first time home buyers um, who live in this specific region. These are the goals of my study. These are my research questions. So you still have to do that critical thinking and sort of have that, that strategy. Um, I also found that it was really helpful if I gave ChatGPT templates. So if I, so, you know, at Nielsen Norman Group, we have various templates to standardize and speed up our research, just research ops type things. So I was able to give it some templates to sort of base its um, its uh, drafts on, and that was really helpful. But again, I I did notice when I was doing this, overall, I would say like 80, 90% of, of the drafts were really great but there were things missing and there were some, you know, for example, screener questions that weren't quite right. And my concern for a lot of people is I'm like, I mean, I've been doing UX research for like 14 years. I don't know if new people would be able to catch those issues. So I would really recommend if you're new to research or design and you're trying to use chat GPT in this way, it's a good idea to also have a mentor, like a human mentor. You know, ChatGPT can be great at helping you understand and learn things, but it soaked up all of the advice on the internet, and there's a lot of bad UX advice on the internet. That's true. It's kind of that a long. Maybe one of the, that may be one of the next generations that it becomes better at prioritizing, understanding what's good or bad sources. But yeah, no, I mean, what you're saying is actually many interesting because it's very much almost like the standard advice for prompt engineering, which is like a what's called few shot, for example, like tell, give the uh, AI some examples of what you're looking for that's good, that you, you think is good, and it'll do more of that, like, like that. But you can also ask it, you know, what are things that would be helpful to, for you to know in creating this plan? And, and so it'll ask, it'll give you some questions that may or may not, again, humans have to check on it, but it'll prompt you for some things that you may have overlooked. And I think that's one of the benefits is just as it may overlook something that you have to fix for it. Conversely, it may think of, I think is a bad word, but it may it may bring up things that you have not thought of as you know, but you didn't think of it in the moment. And so I think there's all these ways in which it does it does uplift. And actually to for Kaldeep's point before about how the junior staff is kind of accelerating their learning curve, that's, that's another kind of metaphor for AI, which is it's a seniority boost. So it brings people up at a faster rate. I mean, you still start from the beginning the first time you do something, but then you can accelerate faster because it's just in time learning and it's contextualized learning to that your exact current problem. Uh, again, like you can ask it, well, what are things that would help you make a better, let's say, recruiting screen or what do you, what would you need to know? And it'll ask about certain things that you maybe didn't think about, but now you think about them. So I, I feel like there's a lot of benef benefits there to you know, I mean, basically, as the studies already show, like, you know, accelerate productivity, uh, improve productivity and increase you know, job satisfaction for the people doing it, because much of that tedious work 
like you know, Kate, in her example, you get to the exit of research faster because you don't have to like type up all these documents and you want to fix them. Fixing is always faster than creating from scratch. Mm -hmm. But you do have to have that human element of fixing it. I, I completely agree with that. Mix, mix. Another, yeah, go ahead, Kate. I was just going to say an, another example that um, I and other like UX designer type roles have found really helpful for AI, things like ChatGPT, is um, generating web copy. So in particular, things like button labels, UI labels, the way that these large language models work is they're looking at like, you know, what, how, how are these correlations sort of happening? Like what, what is the language that's most commonly used in these situations, which is perfect for usability because in general, we want to make sure that we're not coming up with a label that's so out there that nobody's ever heard of it before and doesn't know what it means. Um, so it is a really good tool. You can explain what kind of UI copy you're looking for. One thing I like to do is take a screenshot and then describe where in the screenshot I want it to help me generate copy. You know, let's say it's like a screenshot of a homepage and there's buttons on the top. I might say generate copy for those buttons. I usually, again, you, you do have to be very specific with what you want. And the more you play with these tools, the more you get a sense of this. But you have to, for example, for web copy, I have to say, don't be cute, don't be clever. Because <laughs> sometimes if ChatGPT thinks it's writing marketing copy or like copy for like a social media post, it'll you've probably seen, it'll like cram all these emojis and exclamation points and stuff. So you do have to give it some, some guardrails, I find. But well, that's, a, very that's an important point, guardrails, because there were lots of questions around, hey, are, are there blind spots? Um, because gen, gen, generally, everyone seems to be excited about generative AI as it stands today. Uh, while people don't know exactly how it will all work out over the next two years and how all the integrated products might, uh, uh, there, there's also a, there's a part of the community that is afraid, fearful, and then there is a part of the community that is asking more rational questions. Hey, what am I missing? Are there privacy concerns? Are there, are there blind spots to be to be uh, careful about? Are there ethical issues? And any thoughts uh, first, Jacob, and then uh, Kate? I know you you published some some uh, uh, things around this as well. So, Jacob, I, well, I feel like the the biggest ethical concern is not moving ahead at full speed. Full moving ahead at full speed is what we need to do. Because if you think about the potential for improving the world economy, which means saving you know, hundreds of millions of lives of people in poor countries, improving the education of people who are children you know, who are going to school where the school the teachers don't show up half the time. I mean, improving uh, healthcare, medical care for people who live like 100 kilometers from the nearest doctor's office and they can get now you know, specialized healthcare individualized to them. Uh, through AI. I mean, those advances will be huge benefits to your humanity. It's a little bit different than what we're talking about, I mean, improving an e-commerce site, which is also important. All these things are important. They will all improve our standard of living. But in particular, in terms of ethical, I, I think the ethical mandate is to improve the world economy at the fastest pace we can to you know, uplift you know, the, the billion people who are still living in you know, extreme poverty. And that's what we, what we can do if we move full speed ahead. And I mean, all the doomers who are talking about, oh, all this thing that might, might happen, but it's only might happen. It's actually not actually happening. Uh, you could come up with specific things that are bad, like sort of like the deep fakes that are trying to cheat, it, you know, cheat some poor finance person or company to make a bank transfer that shouldn't have happened because this finance person thinks they're talking to colleagues from the company and it's just a made up video. Those are ab absolutely there. There are downsides and, and you know, dark design patterns, all those things absolutely are there. And they can be more dark than in the past because they can now be more individualized, customized to you. Very precise, what's called spearfish you know, like very precisely directed just at you because it's individualized by AI knowing all this stuff and creating an email crafted just for you or even a fake video just for you. That Those are absolutely downsides. And I think it's good to, to work on ways of, let's say, authenticating that the video is real and various other things of that nature. Those things need to be done, but they shouldn't cause us to not move full speed ahead with AI because I mean anything has upsides and downsides, but the upsides are so enormous that we need to get them as soon as we can. And in terms of like 
to just wind back a little bit. So in terms of, of, of people watching this today, um, if you have not yet started to use AI tools in your work, I would just say start now, start not even tomorrow, but start today. And so like one of our slogans Kate and I came up with was like, uh, start now, but start small, because we talk about very grandiose things, uh, and that can be overwhelming and can be scary. And there's these potential downsides and so forth and so forth. But what about if you want to, as Kate says, give me 10 ideas for this label, button label, and you pick the best one. Or if you're doing user research, um, give me 20 ideas for, for tasks that I can ask the user to perform and uh, give you 20 ideas and half of them may be bad, right? And this is where you have to imply your human judgment. But then you get 10 tasks that are good and half of them you wouldn't have thought of yourself and you get them in one minute. So productivity is up, quality is up just as we all talked about. So some of those very simple steps you can do today, whatever you're working on today, ask AI, give me 10 ideas for that. Even give me 10 rewrites of the subject line for this email I'm going to send out to my team. If you can't think of anything else, at least like rewrite your subject line to be better. 10 ideas at least. Always ask for many ideas. That's one of the key things. Mm -hmm. Ideation is free. Ask for more ideas. So um, definitely agree with that advice, as you know, Jacob, that I think everybody should start playing with this because you kind of need to experiment with it, play with it for a while to wrap your mind and form a mental model on how these tools work, how to best interact with them, what they can do, what they're not so good at doing. Um, totally agree with that. I also do agree that in the long run, I think this, I hope <laughs> this will turn out positively for humanity. Uh, but Jacob and I have spent a lot of time debating this as well. I'm a, I'm a little bit more pessimistic about the short term. Um, I, I don't know what there is to do about it, but I do think it's it's going to cause quite a bit of upheaval socially, economically, um, because the pace of change is so much faster than anything we've seen before. And really, it is, I think, going to be akin to the Industrial Revolution, but even more accelerated and more impactful. Um, and that's not going to be entirely good <laughs> for everyone. Um, this is kind of getting outside of the scope of UX, but there are a lot of cons and this is not, I'll say this is not my expertise, but it's something that I, I read a lot about. Um, there are quite a few concerns about the environmental impact, the processing power that's required if everybody and their mother is <laughs> using these AI systems as frequently as I think we all will. Um, there are ethical issues around how the models have been developed and trained and, and how um, the, the, the sort of workers who have been used to help train these models um, have been treated. So I think, I, you know, I think those are all legitimate concerns um, and things that we're going to have to adjust and, and kind of grapple with. I also am a little concerned about the social upheaval as so many jobs are rapidly changing. You know, as Jacob says, people, you know, companies fire half their workforce. Like it, we, we're getting into like more economic, political yeah, <laughs> debate I mean, here. But, but I think the point to remember about that is, yes, I do think that most companies should lay off half their workforce and in UX, maybe three quarters of their workforce because you know, the old school UX companies aren't going to be needed anymore because everybody will be doing it themselves in their own companies. But it'll create four times as many jobs for those people who will be doing it. Um, I mean, I'm just making up the number four times, but the, the general point, because this has been shown in, in history for 10,000 years, is that when you have this revolution from an old school way of doing things to a new school way of doing things, yeah, all the old, um, many of the old jobs do go away, but many more new jobs are created because there's not a limit to the human imagination of things we can do. In fact, I would even claim that with AI, because it's this ideation powerhouse, there'll be even more ideas for things we can do. And, and also, you know, as Kate was pointing out, many of those things are, are not good ideas, as it turns out. Like some of these AI tools that's coming out, like 50 new things every day is being launched if you follow the, the news. And most of those will probably end up not working and going out of business. And I really, the analogy to me is very strong with the dot-com bubble. There were so many e-commerce or dot-com in general internet companies coming out. You know, every day there was all these new ones being funded with large amounts of money from the venture capital. And a lot of them didn't work. Some of them didn't work because in general it was a bad idea. Others didn't work like the famous uh, buying your dog food on the internet and having it shipped. It didn't work back then. 
because the supply chain was not up to snuff to send shipping out big heavy items. Today, you can absolutely buy dog food and click one click and it comes the next day because now Amazon and other companies have built up that supply chain. And I think that is the same here. I mean, it's not just we got to go and do new AI tools. We have to change the way we do work. And that's a UX concern, right? The task analysis, changing the workflow. And then after that, we have to change the way uh, companies work. And that's a slower process. And that I do think will take about 10 years. So, um, but those are all kind of within our remedies. It's type of, of, of questions that human factors people have always been asking, like how should work be structured? And it should be structured in different ways. Now it can be done in new ways. This is the task artifact cycle. So that's another kind of rather old idea that's coming back in force because we can really change the way we do things. So right now we're changing the way we do individual work. Like I was just saying, if you're writing tasks for a use usability study, ask the AI to give you 20 ideas for tasks and you use the, the good half of them. That's a very small change. It'll save you a few hours worth taking, but really changing the way the company works, that may take 10 years. Yeah. I do think we're going to see a lot of uh, changing attitudes and uh, as a society, we're going to change in terms of how we perceive certain concepts like content marketing and intellectual property. I think the definition of those things are, is changing quite a bit right now. Um, and, uh, you know, I think it, I just recently saw some some jerk invented a, a AI tool that removes watermarks from images, which is annoying for uh, for our team at Nielsen Norman Group because we work really hard on creating clear visuals that communicate UX ideas and people are often putting their names on it. So, you know, those kinds of things I think are, are gonna be a bit chaotic for a while. I think our understanding of privacy is gonna change. Um, in order for these tools to be really, really useful in people's everyday lives, it, they're gonna have to know everything about me. You know, the most useful AI tool would be one that for me that like is listening in on every conversation I have and knows everything that I buy online and has access to my credit cards and my all of my app, app you know, sign in stuff so it can do things for me. I think that's that's gonna be happening quite soon. And I think there are quite a few privacy concerns. For right now, you know, in the context of UX and specifically UX research and design, I don't recommend sharing anything with ChatGPT or any other AI tool that you would not, not want someone else to have access to. So that means don't upload your participant private information, email addresses, names, um, anything like that. If you have a, a secret proto prototype, I wouldn't, <laughs> wouldn't upload that into ChatGPT and ask for- <laughs> Thank you actually, Kate. But, Thank you uh, for okay. mentioning that, which is uh, while through this conversation, we're encouraging everyone to start small, start now, as Jacob said, right? And, and pilot and experiment and, and, and build your mental models and get better at it because the, the change wave is coming. But many companies that we work with, certainly at UX Reactor, have their own individual policies around what can and cannot be shared. So absolutely follow those policies. And as Kate mentioned, just use your judgment, your, your, your do not put anything out there that you do not want anyone to see. So we're, we're not encouraging any of that. So uh, interesting conversation, lots of things to talk about. As I said, there are 85 questions. We probably can spend five hours talking about all, all of this and, and, and but we will we'll have to uh, wrap up in, in say 10 minutes or so. Um, Jacob, there have been a lot of questions around uh, the current struggles and, and they might or might not be AI related. And so there are a whole lot of UXers, both designers and researchers, even managers and directors who are trying to figure out the age old question, hey, how do I influence the product roadmap more? How do I influence uh, and amplify my impact with stakeholders, um, and 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 how do I do more of this? Yeah. And and so, any any thoughts around this? Well, I mean, I think I have two answers to that, and one is what we've already been talked about for most of of, of today, which is uh, with AI you can have bigger productivity, you can create more, you can have more ideation, more more interesting ideas, and so one of the reasons UX has not 
worked so well in the past or has, has not has as much influence in the past is that it has been rather expensive. It's very bespoke. It's like these expensive tailors in London that will measure you and make a very beautiful suit, but it costs a fortune. And so not that many people will, will have those suits. And similarly here, if you ex is very handmade and, and takes a lot of time to get anything done, it becomes expensive, it gets less, it gets used less, it has less influence. That's why I've actually in my entire career been pushing discount usability, fast, cheap methods. And now they can be even faster, they can be even cheaper, and that means they'll be used even more. So that's kind of the one half of the, of the, the game. We need to make UX cheaper, and that is happening, but we do need, it is still too expensive, it only makes economic sense to use it for like important things, not for like some small design project in a tiny company. But that's what I predict will happen over the next 20 years. This is why I predict enormous growth in UX staff, even if you know certain co specific individual companies that have big staffs now may cut them in half, but there'll be so many more new jobs. Okay, that was half the answer. The other half of the answer is actually get away from this point about doing the work and getting, getting results. I mean, we need that. If you don't have results, you don't have anything to talk about. But then the second half is, well, you got to be, you know, a persuader, I guess. It, 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 uh, you have to be an influencer. You have to actually talk the talk. You have to understand the business. You have to explain how do we make more money by doing better design. And of course, in e-commerce companies, it's very easy because you can double your sales by you know, improving uh, different aspects of your of your website. In other companies, it might be a little bit harder, but that's the ultimate. I mean, if you want to succeed in business, you have to be a business person and you have to get away from that. I mean, I'm as guilty as many other people of creating, creating vocabulary for UX people like heuristic evaluation. What does that mean for a business person, right? So you don't talk about that by, by those terms to the stakeholders, but yeah, stakeholder management and in general persuasion, persuasion is hugely important. And the, the number one rule in, in that is if you want to succeed in business, be a business person, talk about profits. How can you either, I mean, there are only really two ways to profit, which is either cut cost or, or improve, you know, increase revenue, sell more. And UX is particularly good at, at selling more by making better websites, but we can also cut cost a lot by making work processes much more efficient. I mean, there's so many inefficient processes, in particularly in big companies, that could be redesigned to be much more efficient. So I think I, both of those two angles of profits are there for us to contribute to, and we just need to like actually say that or communi communicate that, which is not always easy, I'll admit that, but that has to be your goal. So do your UX work cheaper, faster, so you have more actual results, because it's not hype, it's real, and then communicate that because if you don't make them understand it you can do the best work in the world and they won't know it's going to be like that tree that falls in the forest that nobody's there to hear it yeah well 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 said i mean articulating that communicating that narrating that story storytelling influencing speaking the business language i think you you touched on all aspects uh katie yeah, I actually, I'm just, a, I totally agree with Jacob's points, but I just have a few additional things to add. Um, yeah, I, I think um, a lot of new UXers, like younger UXers or people just getting started, part of what attracts us to this field is empathy and, um, uh, you know, an ability to really understand and put ourselves in the shoes of the people we're designing for and get excited about making even a minute improvement in their day-to-day -day lives like that's that's what motivates a lot of us um that can't be all <laughs> that we care about or pay attention to and so i think when designers get get so focused on the user which is our job and which is our the role we play and the, the the stakeholder that we're representing in the company we can't lose sight of the fact that it's even though it feels altruistic, in most cases, we're not doing this for charity. In most cases, we're doing this for a business or even even if it's a nonprofit organization, we're doing this to the reason the organization is paying us to do this is so we can help them achieve their goals. So in order to articulate the value of the design work that you do, you first have to understand the value of that design work that you do. Um, I teach our course measuring UX and ROI at Nielsen Group, Nielsen Norman Group, and um, we, so I've spent a lot of time helping teams figure out how to calculate 
all right, we made this improvement in the design. How does that impact business KPIs? Sometimes it's really hard to make that connection. As Jacob said, e-com, it's you know, pretty straightforward and easy. In other cases, it isn't. But what I have learned over the years of helping lots of different teams to do this is sometimes even if you can't end up coming up with that monetary figure that you report out, just sitting down and thinking like, how, as a UX professional, how are my actions impacting the business in a positive way? Just the act of thinking through that is really valuable because then you can articulate that clearly to someone else. Now, that said, Ed, UX professionals have a lot that is asked of them. <laughs> like, it's not an easy job to begin with. And then to also have to fight for our space and our, our and be constantly proving our value in an organization can be draining. Yeah. Um, and I will say, like, I think there's a point at which if you have been the, the lone advocate for UX in your company for years and you're not feeling any kind of shift, it may be time to consider if this is the place for you. That's true. I mean, you can only push so much and then it's, it becomes too much. But but I, we do have to push some. And I feel it's it's uh, it's still a new field. I mean, it doesn't feel a new field to me because I've done it for 41 years. But uh, from in most companies, it is new. And when something is new, it's actually, I think it's, it's understandable that it's not well appreciated, that it's people are a little bit skeptical. What is this new thing? Uh, I mean, the... The, okay, so there's good news, which is UX has been actually exploding over you know, my lifetime. It's really grown dramatically. I'll show you, I have a slide on this. This is like the number of UX people in the world. So we started with about 10 people at Bell Labs, you know, when they invented uh, the touchtone telephone. Then when I started, there were about a thousand people. And so over that, uh, that period, we went up to 3 million. So that's a factor of 3,000, 3,000 more people doing UX while I've been doing it. But what I'm predicting is happening actually is that the next 40 years or so will go only 33 times more, so not 3,000, but 33 times more. So much less growth rate, but in growth numbers, um, 97 million more people will do user experience in the future in, in my prediction. And why do I predict this? Because I was just saying before, so much more widespread and this is both in terms of companies functions with the companies and industries and the most important one is countries or internationalization because you still have a relatively small number of countries that have high ux maturity and then the majority of the world is pretty low ux maturity and they are also often quite poor countries but they are going to get much richer as over the next few decades. And so that's my prediction is it's going to vastly, vastly increase again. Uh, it just may be a little bit different jobs than what they were in the past, but they will, they will, they will come. And uh, so when you, when you think about what, what are the implications of that factor of 3,000 growth from 1,000 people to 3 million people in my career, that is that most UX people are relatively new at it because they started over the over the last last 10 years or so they didn't start those first 30 years very few people started then most of them started recently secondly most companies started recently that goes to what we were just discussing which is it's not ingrained in these companies that our methodologies are just the way things are done because it's new it's just been introduced the vast majority of places it's just been introduced and actually even more places it's not even introduced yet it's to come over the next 10 and 20 years that those companies in a lot of bigger broader spectrum of countries will start doing ux so this problem was set to say probably be with us for at least 20 more years of wow it's new we've got to figure out what it is we're very skeptical we're not going to spend that much money on this unproven idea well it's very proven in the old time places that have done it for 20 years have done it for 30 years but those are very few compared to the many places that just got started the last 10 years 10 years is not enough to achieve high levels of ux maturity it's a slow moving changing process to affect organizational change which is what we have to do to change the work processes to change the standards for how things are done to make it such that the high level executives in a company are people who when they were young worked on teams with the user researcher and they knew they know from personal experience from when they were young 30 years ago how it helped them 
to get the results from that user research into whatever project they were working on 30 years ago. Very, very few executives had that experience now. I mean, it's like really senior, senior, top level executives. They all, they, they don't have that personal experience except for a very small number of com companies. 20 years from now, many more of them will, because those are the people who are now newbies working side by side with some hopefully great, brilliant UX people who are, who are showing their value to their colleagues. That colleague will in 10 years be a some little bit higher level manager, in 20 years a much higher level manager, and eventually like the big boss of the million person company, and will 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 know from personal experience. They don't know from personal experience now because UX is new most places. Yeah. Wow. And then I'm, I'm still I'm still trying to, to from from uh, up to three million now and from three million to hundred million. Uh, I've seen in the past the exponential growth curves uh, that that you you have published and and all the all the doom and gloom that sometimes I see on, on, on LinkedIn. Uh, it, yeah. yeah, I think that's so short term thinking. Of course, there's some setbacks. And if you look at a hundred year history, which UX really is, uh, I mean, 40 years to come, 60 years have happened. Um, there've already been, bl been blips on, on those curves. I mean, you can draw the curve and it looks smooth, but the real lived reality is up and down and up and down. And particularly for individual people, yeah, okay, you're fired, but that doesn't mean that you're not going to get another job you know, later. And in particular for the world, there's going to be many, many, many more new jobs. So I feel like that's the way to look at it, is to look at the long perspective, which is immense growth. Now, I am predicting that the growth weight, rate will decline because it was really like a true, you know, explosive growth in, in the last sort of 30 years. Uh, that I don't necessarily think will will, ha will will happen. But I do think that the growth number, the absolute number, which is really, we live in a linear world. We live in the world of the actual number, not of these drawn curves on logarithmic scale charts. Um, that, that the absolute number is going to be enormously huge. And that is a challenge for those of us who are, you know, all of us who are on this call here and who are already experienced people, right? We have to like transmit this accumulated knowledge for the first 60 years of UX onto these 97 million new people who are going to join. Now, luckily, we do have AI to help us with that because, again, it's just-in-time learning, which is much more efficient than the old-school learning that we had to go through. So we can accelerate people more, but the learning has to come from somewhere. You know, It has to come from us, and so we have to be the mentors. I'm very, very keen on places like ADP List, which are trying to mentor the, the, the new people because honestly, there are going to be so many new people and we have to have a better handle on helping them. Uh, and, so, and, and But I mean, I think that will happen, but, it, but uh, it, it's just a challenge for, for our next 20 years of UX is to handle the magnitude of growth, particularly international growth, worldwide growth. Yeah, very, very insightful conversation, Jacob and Kate. Uh, I know we are at time. Um, and so any any last uh, uh, set of thoughts, advice, AI or otherwise, uh, because the field is growing. There are lots of new people. There are, uh, I get a lot of questions. I do, by the way, a lot of mentorship sessions through ADP list. I just recently completed 105 of these sessions. So wow. I've spent a lot of time. Well done on being a mentor and, and trying to give back to the community. And there's a there's a range of uh, uh, people within the first five to 10 years of experience who are either wanting to become managers or, or new leaders. And, and they have sets of questions. And it's very interesting, the, the younger they are and the, the less managerial experience they have, the harder it is for them to acknowledge that, that they don't know something. Uh, after a while, I'm like, I'm, I'm perfectly fine these days. I, I don't have the things that somebody asked me and, and that's fine. I'm, I'm fine with it. So so any any high level thoughts, uh, both from you, Kate and Jacob, around people that are wanting to move into leadership positions, people who, that are newer managers, how should they look at this whole thing from a UX angle, either designers or researchers? Um, I'll go with Kate first and then Jacob. Yeah, I just wanted to um, kind of pick up on, on Jacob's last point set of points there about um, kind of looking over the like long term trajectory of the field. Jacob has to remind me of that very often, especially in the last couple of years, because it's been pretty 
rough uh, in UX. And um, I think that's because the vast majority of people in UX right now, because we've seen this exponential growth, have not been in the field for, for very long. I mean, I think that the, you know, let alone the 40 years that you have Jacob or the 25 years that you have Cold Deep, I think a lot of people have, have really just started. Um, and within the past, you know, decade and some change, we have seen pretty, pretty steady growth in tech and an explosion of tech jobs. So this does feel for people who maybe have my level of experience or less feels like, wow, where did this come from? You know, this is feels brand new. So it is nice to be reminded that there are these ups and downs and that AI is probably going to take us on the next, um, the next kind of wave. Um, in terms of like, helping people who are who are new to the field definitely agree adp list is a great place to look for mentorship i'll have to also do a plug for nielsen norman group at ngroup.com we have a library of over 2,000 free articles and videos a lot of those are focused on defining some of the essential concepts that new ux professionals need to know um, and also a lot of advice on things like that are more intangible like the stakeholder management um, and those are the skills that I think we don't talk as much about in UX sometimes, and they are the most essential to move into leadership. You do have to learn how to, how to manage stakeholders and how to talk to leadership and think about where your work and your team's work fits within the business and align your work to those larger goals. Those, but the good news is those soft skills, a lot of those come naturally, I find, to, to some UX people because, again, UXers, we tend to be empathetic. We tend to pay a lot of attention to social cues and have high emotional intelligence. And so, you know, we're more likely to pick up on conflict or, you know, something not quite right with a client or a stakeholder. And so the, the best advice I have is to not neglect those things. Even if they're not UX specific, if you want to be a leader in any field, you do need to develop those skills. Right. So what, what I might add is that the term leader and manager are two separate terms and two separate concepts. And so I would encourage people to not only think of, of management as the only way ahead. Um, so if we go back to my point before about the growth of the UX field, which again, not in any one year, but over any kind of longer period of time. So over the next 10 years, I'm expecting that we'll be about three times more uh, in UX in the world than we are now. And so that, by definition, means that anybody who starts now will in 10 years be in the best or the most experienced anyway, one third of the field, because it's going to be three times bigger. The other two thirds of people who are going to be joining us over the next 10 years. So you will automatically be, well, you're not automatically be a leader, but you will automatically be one of the most experienced people just by being, having already started now, which is still early in the bigger scheme of things. So. Then we have so we have three concepts, right? We have experience, we have being you know, a thought leader or a work leader, and then we have being a manager. And so you have to like think about which of those you want to you want to like emphasize. I'm mean, experienced comes by just like actually working, so just keep cranking it out, which is good. But then you can take that experience and transform it into becoming more of a of a thought leader, of going of becoming more of an architect, taking on bigger responsibility. And I do think that is more likely. In the past, we said we have two paths, and you know, some people take one, some people take the other. But my thinking is that that management path will be less so in the future, because I feel there'll be few of those big UX teams. So yeah, there'll be some UX managers, but there'll be very few UX directors and even fewer UX VPs. So that kind of thought of, oh, my ladder is, get ever more underlings under me. I just, I'm not quite sure that's going to be, it'll be as, as, as strong, a big phenomenon in the future. So if you aim towards that, you may be more likely to be disappointed, but there's an, no end to how much of an expert you can become. And, and even with the AI tools, AI tools uplifts everybody, but the better you are at, man, at using them and taking advantage of them. And if you can get ideations free, you can get 20 ideas. Well, picking the, the right one now, that takes the talent and you can hone that skill and be better and better and better at it. So that would actually be, I mean, there are both, there are both ladders, there are both uh, options, but don't get too enamored of that management option. I think it, I would think it's more likely 
to be fruitful and, and, and successful and rewarding and, and personally satisfying and all those type of things for many people to pursue the expertise uh, path instead. Thinking about how the future is likely going to play out, of course, we don't, we don't know, right? But that is my prediction of how it will work. How yeah. it will go. Wow. Thank you, Jacob. Thank you, Kate. Um, thank you to all the listeners who, uh, I guess, were on the 10 minutes over. So yeah. there's, I'm, I'm seeing almost everyone is still here. So, so clearly people who are interested in everything that you, Jacob, and Kate had to say. Uh, insightful conversation, uh, certainly for me. And I'm seeing several comments uh, thanking both of you uh, with with uh, impactful session insights. I mean, uh, at the end of this session, certainly we're recording this. So the recording will be available on uh, YouTube, will be available on the UX Reactor website. And so y- y- the w- once the recording is available, we'll send out a notification to everyone. Okay, thank you very much, Jacob. Thank you, Kate. On behalf of UX Ignite, a live podcast uh, series uh, and from UX Reactor, thank you to everyone that attended. Talk to you guys soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's a wrap for UX Ignite. Keep the UX fire burning. Subscribe, share, and stay inspired. Until next time, ignite your research journey.